Simon, before we actually talk about Qatar, your experience and everything else, once again, you know, you're, you know, you wake up in New Zealand and there's a World Cup shock, a genuine bona fide World Cup shock. Hip hip hooray, Japan! Yeah, incredible, huh? Um, and it certainly didn't look as though it was going to be the case when uh, Germany took the lead. It's very similar to Argentina, Saudi Arabia a couple of days ago. Uh, penalty from Ilkay Gundogan, of course, a couple of days ago, it was messy. And you just thought uh, Germany would go on and, and win quite comfortably. And, and they did dominate the game, to be fair, uh, particularly in that first half. Chuichi Gonda made some terrific saves. Uh, and then Japan came out with, uh, you know, a renewed confidence after the break and uh, managed to win the game. Ritsu Doan and uh, Asano with the winner late on. And obviously from an Asian perspective, and, you know, we speak as, uh, as a member of uh, the AFC in terms of Australia. It's great to see uh, Saudi Arabia knocking off Argentina. Now Japan beating Germany. It shows that uh, the AFC is not perhaps as weak as some people would uh, would make out. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, now, once you've had a shock result like this, you've got to go on from there. Look, you know, and Japan have performed and got through to the knockout stages at World Cups before. Uh, we've seen Saudi you know, Arabia, I think, in the United States score some fantastic goals and things. But, you know, is, yeah. is, 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 this, is this the next major step? You know, absorb the euphoria of that, but then get back down to business and actually get the points you need to get out of the group. Well, that's right. And, you know, we, we saw this with Australia at the Olympics. Um, you know, Australia beat uh, Argentina in the first game of, of the Tokyo Games. And we, we thought, wow, you know, this is, uh, this is amazing. But it, it means nothing if you then go on to, to lose the next two and go home early. So you, you've got to back it up. Uh, J Japan in particular, in a very tough section. The Saudis too, in fairness. Uh, but, you know, to have three points on the board from two games that you would have probably said on paper were, you know, stone cold bankers for Germany and Argentina uh, is incredible. And I, and I hope they can push on with it. And, you know, to be fair, both those nations were in Australia's World Cup qualifying group. So we saw them, you know, up, up close and personal. We, we know their quality. I mean, Japan in particular were terrific when they came to Sydney. They, they played Australia off a break and we know the quality that they've got. They're a very good technical team. Um, I, I've always thought that for years they're just really missing a proper, you know, central striker, somebody who can score regularly for them. But uh, it, it's a terrific win for the Japanese in particular. Only 26% possession they had. I think that's the, the second lowest yeah, yeah. in history uh, what, when winning a game at the World Cup. And, uh, of course, for Germany, it's a bit of deja vu because they lost to South Korea in 2018 and finished bottom of the group in Russia. And and I think that was the other game where they talk about the percentages have been you know, the lowest ever in, in, in possession and still winning yes. a game. I mean, what does it say about those kind of stats, doesn't it? I mean, the only stat that counts is ball and back of onion, isn't it? Well, of course it does. Um, I mean, obviously, the, you know, if you have a great weight of possession, then uh, by the law of averages, you think that you're going to create more chances. But uh, I, I think we've, you know, we've moved away, certainly in Australia, we've moved away from talking about possession for possession states. Uh, uh, sakes and you know more onto effective possession where do you have the ball uh, you know you, you, you can string together 30 passes but if it's all in your own half of the pitch then really it means nothing um, you've got to do something with that possession and uh, unfortunately for Germany today they couldn't Simon Hill who calls the A-League out of Australia of course and spends a lot of time with us and we thank you so much for your time in Qatar as uh, Australia like yesterday got off to a rocket start but France again showing their class England showing their class the Netherlands the same so some of the big boys have come to play let's actually look at that Australian performance though they, I'm sure that the players would be very disappointed just a little slow on the touch a little you know maybe just uh, you know taking a bit too much time and actually put themselves under a lot of pressure and that pace that France have got up front is devastating yeah it is i mean to be honest yesterday the the first 20 minutes were terrific for australia um and we were you know sensing perhaps another upset uh craig goodwin scored a terrific goal uh beautifully set up by matt lecky and they had france worried and you know mitch duke went close to a second had it gone to two nil then it might have been a different story but uh you know, France are the world champions uh, and they're not the, the best team in the world uh, for nothing. And, you know, when you when you look at the, the attacking 
riches that they have. Kylian Mbappe uh, was terrific on the left. Osman Dembele on the right. Antoine Griezmann just uh, playing in the spaces and the little pockets between the defensive lines. Uh, Olivier Giroud, 36 years old, but you know still uh, a deadly striker inside the box. Uh, thank goodness they didn't have Benzema as well. Otherwise, we'd have been in real trouble. But uh, yeah, it, it was an exhibition, to be honest, particularly in that second half. And you know, Australia, it, it's no embarrassment to, to lose to the world champions. It's just so frustrating that they did so on the back of such an encouraging first 20 minutes. And really, you know, for me, I think a lot of people, the second goal was the killer. And this is one thing that I think Australia has to learn. We've become so obsessed in this country or Australia, I should say, with, with playing out from the back at all costs. Mm. And sometimes you've got to choose your moments. And that was not the moment to do it. Uh, and unfortunately, we, you know, we paid the price uh, heavily. And from then on in, I think really it was a matter of how many. So I'm in Spain today. Uh, it, it look, a, a pretty new look, kind of fresh looking side. Uh, Costa Rica. I mean, I, look, I always feel, I, 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 I never like a 7-0 scoreline. I mean, even when the kids were playing, you kind of, I just feel a bit icky about it. I mean, the poor old Costa Rica. I mean, they're, they're on merit. Of course, you know, they qualified to get there and things. But were Costa Rica that bad or was Spain just that good? Well, I think it's a little bit of a mixture of both. I mean, you know, you, you know better than me, but I thought Costa Rica were a little bit fortunate to get through the playoff against uh, your boys. Um, and they're an ageing team. Um, you're right, they've burned the right to be there. But, I mean, Spain were just brutal. They, they ripped them to pieces. And I'm I'm actually quite excited by this Spanish team. Luis Enrique has you set them up to attack. He's, uh, you know, regenerated the side. He included two teenagers uh, Gavi and Pedri, uh, 18 and 19. Gavi scored the, the youngest Spanish player ever to score at a World Cup finals. A uh, couple for Ferran Torres. And uh, I mean, really, it could have been a cricket score in the end. Um, and, and I think it's probably testament to their professionalism that they didn't take their foot off the gas. Uh, and, you know, they kept going for the jugular. So, yeah, may, maybe Spain, <clears throat> you know, along with one or two others, are going to be uh, one of those Smokies who nobody's really talked about pre-tournament, but uh, they could easily challenge. There's no doubt about that on today's performance. What about your heritage? What about old Blighty? Is it coming home again? Pretty impressive against Iran. <laughs> People do get a uh, little bit misconstrued with this coming home. You know, you know, the song was about coming home to England for the European yeah. Championships in 1996. Yeah, Because we were the hosts. That's it. I know. I know. <laughs> and it's now, it's now taken on a completely different meaning, which is ridiculous. But look, I, I don't think uh, England are going to win the World Cup. No. Uh, I think they might get to the quarterfinals. I certainly think they'll get through the group. They were very good against Iran. But the, the caveat against it is that even against an Iranian team that has, let's be honest, their minds on other things... Uh, they still conceded two goals. Uh, now, yes, they scored six at the other end. But, you know, when they get to the quarterfinals, if they get that far, they will probably face Brazil. And they're not going to be able to score six against Brazil, but they might concede two or three against Brazil. So they, they, they've got some work to do defensively. I, I think that's England's Achilles heel. The attack is plenty good enough um, to win a World Cup. But unfortunately, I just don't think the defence is... Simon Hills in Qatar for us um, on the platform. And, uh, you know, we get to see Brazil play Serbia tomorrow. That's going to be a fascinating game. By that stage, uh, every team would have played one. Portugal would have played as well. And look, when you go into a World Cup, Simon, I mean, people ask me who's going to win. And I always say, look, in the history of the tournament, there's only eight teams that have won it. Italy aren't there, so count them out. I'm not sure Uruguay, Uruguay were quite up to it. So if we park them on the side. And then you're looking at Germany, Argentina, Brazil, England, France, Spain. Well, we've already seen two of those teams, Germany and Argentina, lose. So what does it actually say about Brazil? I mean, you know, they had that horror at home against Germany 7-1 in that semi-final. It's probably haunted them absolutely ever since. Are they, are they the team now that maybe attention's turning to that, you know, this could be the most consistent side and, the, and normally the most consistent side wins it? Yeah, well, I mean, they're the bookies' favourites, certainly with a lot of the bookies anyway, to win the tournament and... You know, I can't argue with that. They're 15 games unbeaten. They've got such attacking flair, as we know. You know, Neymar, Gabriel Jesus, uh, Gabriel as well, who's playing well for Arsenal. Uh, the one question mark against Brazil, and it, it could well be exploited by Serbia tomorrow. 
who play with two very good strikers in it, Alexander Mitrovic and Dusan Vlajevic. Uh, whether they've they've got a little bit of a creaking defence. Thiago Silva is 38 years of age. He's you know not the quickest anymore. Um, but to be honest, you, you just think Brazil will outscore most teams. So. Uh, I think that's a bit, it's a very good test for them tomorrow. I think if they come through that, they will have, you know, probably justified that early favouritism. But I'd equally been very impressed with Spain that we have already talked about, and France. Um, you know, the, the French uh, have, have got a terrific side, such talent, and uh, yeah, I think it's it's going to be one of those you know the former winners that you mentioned that will will probably lift the trophy. I hope it's England, but I can't see it. Well, Portugal play uh, overnight at New Zealand at time. And, of course, the R word is going to be uppermost in everyone's minds, isn't it? And, you know, so first it's going to be him on the pitch and then everything else that goes alongside it. Ronaldo will be the biggest story of the day, as always. Yeah, he will be. And, uh, of course, he's now looking for a new club. Um, A-League, Simon, you know, A-League, we've, if we've you get a chance, put offer. that question yeah. to him. Yeah, go on. Yeah. Well, you know, he's uh, he's been made an offer uh, through his agent, Jorge Mendes, uh, by the APL representative, Danny Townsend. So you never know. I look, I, I don't think it'll happen, to be honest. Um, but it, it would be nice if it did. In terms of, you know, his Portuguese team tomorrow, well, again, they're a side that is stacked full of talent and not many people are talking about them. But you look at the players that they have, Bernardo Silva, Bruno Fernandes, Ruben Diaz, uh, Joao Cancelo, Ruben Neves, all uh, playing in the Premier League, all you know, absolutely top class players, and that's before we start talking about Ronaldo. So, it's it, it's possible that Portugal could mount a challenge, um, and if they do, of course, this will almost certainly be Ronaldo's last World Cup. He's never won it, same as Leo Messi, uh, and those two have been the best players of, of you know this current generation, and, and both are going for the World Cup that they've never won for for the last time. So. Uh, maybe there's a bit of you know romance left in the game for one of them at least. All right, we've talked all about the football. Now we've got to talk about the stuff that is happening outside of the football. Uh, the German <clears throat> team today, yeah. the photo with their hands over their mouths. I mean, I don't know whether that backfires when you actually lose the game. Simon, we've talked about this in the past, mate. Politics and sport go hand in hand, and, and you're an absolute idiot if you think that the two can be separated at the hip because they can't. Uh, the armbands have sold out. We've seen reporters get in trouble for for wearing those love things or wearing a rainbow thing. Is it is it is it a really visible thing that's going on? Or is it or is it just every time there's an incident, obviously the media make the most of it? Well look, <clears throat> you know, this has been the most political World Cup that I can ever remember. Um, there are, there's so many issues. And of course it's you know largely come about because we've come to a part of the world um, that we don't normally for for a World Cup finals, and we, we've had to shift the traditional time slots of it uh, to accommodate it. Now, in in fairness, you know, my view is I, I don't blame the Qataris really. You know, we we knew what their country was all about. Um, we know it's a conservative nation. Um, my beef is with FIFA because they knew it too twelve years ago. And, you know, if they are true to their statutes of inclusion and equality and everybody being welcome, et cetera, et cetera, then really they should have insisted upon, you know, all of these requirements being met before they uh, awarded the hosting to Qatar. So I, I don't blame the hosts. Um, they are staying true to themselves. It's FIFA that hasn't. It's FIFA that's changed. And we all know the reason why. Mm. They had 12 years to to correct what the then president, Sat Blatter, has admitted recently was a mistake. Uh, and that's, you know, putting it's it a kindly. Nice way. Yes, so exactly. you, 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 can, you can hold FIFA entirely accountable for this. And I thought Gianni Infantino's comments where he tried to deflect no, a few days ago and say, well, God. European colonizers should look at themselves. Absolutely shameless, disgraceful. So does does the tournament eventually overtake all that, or is your gut feeling that because it is just instant headlines and a lot of clickbait that we're going to keep hearing about all of this, and there, and there are going to be instances, protests, uh, actions taken throughout this tournament, by, both on the field and off the field? 
Well, look, there probably will be. Um, you know, if, if you want to point the finger of blame at anybody else, look, it's, you know, it's all very well for the federations. And, and we're, we're talking specifically here about the German Federation, but there are others, uh, England amongst them, Switzerland, Spain, you know, there's several others who said they were going to wear this armband. Well, wh where were all these protests 12 years ago? Where were they in the build-up to this World Cup? Um, you know, it's it's all very well to, and I know it's it's more visible when you're actually at the World Cup, but it, it's all very well to virtue signal when you're here. Um, you know, wh wh why didn't they make a stand uh, 12 years ago? Why didn't the players say, well, you know, if if uh, if inclusion is not part of this message, then we won't play. You know, they, they're the they're the people that. Uh, the fans come to watch and pay their money, um, not the politicians who, who make the decisions. So, you know, the, the players really had the power all along, but they chose not to use it. Um, now they're, you know, kicking up a bit of a, a song and dance, rightly so as well, in my opinion. But it's, it's all too little, too late from the people who really had the power uh, uh, to change this when, when it was, you know, done and dusted 12 years ago. The players could have said no. FIFA could have said, hang on, we've made a mistake here. We've got to correct it. And, you know, there was a lot about the process that we know wasn't right. Uh, but they didn't. And uh, so, you know, the, FIFA in particular are going to have to cop these uh, protests and the, the increasing damage to their reputation. And I have to say it's it's fully deserved. Thoughtful, insightful, and uh, just a brilliant perspective as always, mate. We thank you so much for giving us so much time. Brilliant. Pleasure, Martin. Anytime.